You're all set, Camille. Camille, you're on mute. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Van Davis uh, has joined WCET, a WICHE Cooperative for Educational Technologies, in 2021 as Chief Strategy Officer, where he is responsible for all aspects of WCET's strategic planning, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, and assisting the team with policy and research efforts. Dr. Davis also serves as Service Design and Strategy Officer with Every Learner Everywhere, where he leads the development and delivery of the organization's service design and delivery work. Dr. Davis has over 25 years of experience in higher education as a faculty member, academic administrator, state policymaker, and ed tech leader. He is a recognized national expert in competency-based education, having led the creation of the Texas Adult Degree Complete Project and the development of the first competency-based bachelor's degree at Texas Public Institutions of Higher Education during his time on the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. He is recognized as a national expert on distance education policy and pedagogy as well. Additionally, Dr. Davis has authored a number of papers, articles, and reports on topics such as competency-based education, open educational resources, the cost of distance education, and alternative higher education funding practices. While not working, Dr. Davis spends time collecting Lego models and dreaming of the day he can complete his Western United States camping trip. So please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dr. Van Davis to the SUNY Online Summit. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you all so much. It is a pleasure to be with you here this morning. Um, I'm looking over here to make sure it's still morning where you are. It's morning where I am here in Austin. Uh, let me share my screen here for a moment. Excellent. And let me see if I can so and get the chat up here as well so I can hopefully be able to keep an eye on questions. So I'm really happy to be here with y'all this morning. Um, I, you will hear me say y'all. I, I live in Texas and did my graduate work uh, in Tennessee. So I never quite got rid of that uh, particular uh, uh, speech. So it's a pleasure, though, for me to be with y'all this morning uh, and talk to you a little bit about the work that we did with OLC on effective practices for developing and supporting um, online adjunct faculty. Uh, this was work that we did uh, to give you a little bit of background. In 2015, we originally did a study with Learning House, WCET did a study with Learning House, uh, where we looked at um, online adjunct faculty practices at educational institutions and looked in the 2015 study, particularly at hiring practices and then um, policy practices around online um, adjuncts. We felt that it was particularly important to update that study in 2021, uh, in part because of what had happened with the pandemic and is still happening with the pandemic, but also because when we look at the data, we see, as you well know, an increasing number of students that are involved in online education. Uh, I believe some of the latest numbers are NCES numbers. Uh, fall 2018 was showing that about 35% of all undergraduates and graduate students were enrolled in at least one online class. And we continue to see a large number of adjuncts. If we look at IPEDS data from 2019, 2020, which is the most recent IPEDS data, at the time of the study. Uh, IPEDS was reporting about 48% of all instructors were part-time, and although some of those might not be adjuncts, a large majority of them will be adjuncts. Uh, and that, to, to give you some context of what that 48% looks like, that equates into approximately seven, a little over 700,000 um, potentially adjunct faculty. So, we have a growing number of students who are enrolled in online education. We have a large number of adjunct faculty. 
the two overlap. It's not hard to create a Venn diagram where we see the two of those overlapping. And so that's why we wanted to update the 2015 study that we did. So as I said, we conducted this study in the summer of 2021. Uh, we surveyed based on the 2020-2021 academic year. We ended up with a little over 116 institutions that participated in the survey. Uh, in addition to the survey, we also conducted follow-up interviews with a dozen institutions, including six that did not participate in the survey. Uh, and it is a small sample size, and so we're not making any claims that this is a representative sample size. But if you look at it, we did have a good mix of two-year and four-year institutions, uh, almost 43% two-year institutions, the rest four-year institutions. Uh, the majority of those overwhelmingly, about three-quarters of them almost, were uh, public institutions with just a little over 28%, so just a little over a quarter were private institutions. And we had a good, um, we felt like a good uh, diversity in the size of institutions as well. Uh, I won't read all of this here on the screen because you're just as capable of reading it, but we did have a little over 19% were small, very small institutions with five, less than 500 FTEs. And then a little over 24% were very large institutions with more than 5,000 FTEs. So it tended to skew a little bit on the larger side, but we did see fairly good, um, we, we did see fairly good diversity in terms of the size of the institutions as well as two year versus four year institutions. Um, we also thought that it was important to spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the, the study itself to do to talk about definitions, because as we all know, um, if anything we learned from the pandemic is that what we mean as online practitioners, it, when we talk about online education, it's not necessarily what other people mean when they talk about online education. And so we wanted to make sure that we um, defined very carefully on campus, online, and then emergency remote instruction, um, which for us is that temporary shift from face-to-face -face instruction to online instruction in response to a crisis, um, and specifically in response to the 2020 COVID pandemic. And we um, asked institutions to only consider their online hybrid and high flex courses. We asked them to not consider emergency remote instruction in their responses to the survey. Uh, we defined blended and hybrid, and then also we felt it was pretty important to define what a high flex course was. Uh, again, we as practitioners know that this idea of high flex courses isn't necessarily anything new. We've been talking about it for a while, but it received a new uh, spurt of focus uh, because of COVID. And so we wanted to make sure that we had carefully defined what things were so that we could as much as possible be comparing apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. Um, I want to talk a little bit first, uh, an overview of what our key findings are, and then I want to dig into a little bit of the data. Uh, and then what I'll do is end by talking about some of our recommendations. And I'll be very transparent with you. Um, this presentation is only gonna take about 35 minutes because I'd really like to spend the rest of the time in question and answers and in dialogue because I'm really interested in hearing about what your experiences have been on your campuses these last few years and what you see as promising practices and what you see as the challenges that you face um, whenever you're working with online adjunct faculty. We had five key findings. Uh, we found that common policies are still lacking, especially when we talk about policies around um, response time for emails, uh, response time for formative and summative assessment. Uh, the second finding was that mandatory training and instructional design support is decreasing. When we looked at especially instructional design support in 2015 versus what it appears to be in 2020, 2021, um, it had decreased slightly. Some of the other trainings that were required in 2015 we found had decreased when we looked at 2021. 
Uh, culturally relevant pedagogical training may not be required, but it is still uh, relatively um, present. The pandemic did not significantly change professional development requirements for faculty, and the most effective online pedagogical practices are often identified as the most challenging to implement. And um, Camille has, has helpfully dropped into the chat there, what are your primary practices with online adjunct faculty and what are your challenges? Love to have you um, go ahead and drop that into the chat as we're having this conversation uh, so that we can talk about it at the end of the presentation. Thank you for doing that, Camille. I really appreciate that. So what did we find with the use of online adjuncts? So we found when we asked folks what their use of online adjuncts was in 2020, 2021, compared to 2019, 2020, we found that it was increased. Um, we have 47% said that they had increased. But when we drilled down, and I think this is, is also particularly important, um, when we drilled down and we asked those 47%, so you say that you've increased, how much have you increased in terms of the use of online adjuncts? We, thought, we found that the amount of increase was actually fairly small. The majority of them said that it was only between one and 24% of an increase. So we see an increase in the use of, of online adjuncts, but it seems to be a slight increase. Uh, and then 43%, a little over 43% said that it stayed the same. Um, fairly small amount said that it had decreased. And again, probably not surprising when we think about what has happened in terms of the increase in the use of online um, instruction, even beyond emergency remote instruction. We also um, asked institutions to talk to us a little bit about their modality specific training. So when we look at online asynchronous, when we look at online synchronous, when we look at hybrid and we look at high flex, how much training are your faculty in those different modalities receiving? And one of the things that we saw was that um, modality specific training is excellent for asynchronous online education. So if you look at that bar graph on the right, which is not the most straightforward bar graph, and I will, I will apologize proactively for that. Um, but it's the proportion of, co of courses taught by adjuncts who did not receive specific development on good practices. And if you look, you see there that 44% of our respondents said basically that none of their faculty teaching online, or I'm sorry, 1.3% said that none of their faculty teaching online asynchronous had not received professional development. So almost all of their faculty teaching online asynchronous had received professional development. And it's okay for online synchronous, 20% and hybrid, 22.1%. So about the same. So a fair number of faculty teaching online synchronous and hybrid had received some professional development specific for that modality. Not surprisingly, though, whenever we look at high flex, we see that there has been much less professional development done for that modality. A part of that probably has to do with how new the implementation, what a wider spread implementation of high flex is. But I would argue, and, and, and I think that my co-authors of the paper would also are, feel comfortable arguing that that's cause for concern, that the newer modalities are the ones that probably need that attention and that professional development the most. And so we see some gaps in modality specific professional development. There's, there's a lot to laud and celebrate with online asynchronous. We have a little bit of ways to go with hybrid and online synchronous, and we've got a long way to go with high flex. Um, one of the other things that we asked folks to, to talk to us about were the requirements. What did they require in terms of professional development? And what we found was that there were three areas in particular 
that folks seem to be doing a good job of requiring professional development. Um, online technologies, so professional development on online technologies was 67.5%. Uh, orientation to academic and student policies was a little over 66%. And then whenever we looked at effective teaching methods, it was a little over 53%. Um, ben, if I just make sure. interrupt, um, we have someone, uh, this is Holly asking um, for a uh, deeper interpretation of the bar graph. She's asking, it, does this mean that only uh, 1.3 of online asynchronous adjuncts did not receive training while 44% of high flex adjuncts did not receive training? That's exactly what it means. Okay. And, and I apologize that it is not the clearest of bar graphs. I, I should probably have prefaced all of this by saying I'm a historian by training uh, and not a data guy. We've in our report have tried to make this a clearer bar graph. Um, unfortunately, this version of it is, is not as clear as we would like, but that is exactly what it means. So almost everyone has been able to almost all online synchronous, uh, asynchronous adjuncts have received some professional development uh, for that modality. Whereas not all, uh, very few actually have received some that are involved in high flex have received some professional development for that modality. So there's a great discrepancy there that, that we think needs to be addressed if modalities like high flex are going to continue to be implemented. And it's something to, to keep in mind as we think about what our professional development opportunities are for online adjuncts. Um, we seem to be, when we talk about requirements for professional development, like I said, we seem to be doing really good when we talk about online technologies, academic and student support policies, and effective teaching methods. Um, one of the things that I think is really heartening here, and this is requirements. This isn't availability of professional development. This is requirements around professional development. One of the things that, that, that we think is actually pretty heartening here is if you look at digital learning and diversity, equity, and inclusion, we see that almost 17% of institutions are requiring, requiring some form of professional development around digital learning, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we see that as, as actually extraordinarily promising. This wasn't something we asked about in 2015. Um, I have some suspicions, as do my co-authors, why we see this happening now in 2020, 2021. Um, this is undoubtedly in response to George Floyd and the protests and Black Lives Matter protests of 2019 and 2020, as well as um, this recognition that um, digital learning, just like any other form of learning, does not work equitably right now in our institutions. And I see um, Stephen put in a, a question there. Did you look specifically at training on making materials accessible? We did not. Um, in a follow-up, we ever are able to do a follow-up study, that's one of those questions that we need to ask because we, we did ask some questions about when training was provided and you'll see later on, but we didn't actually ask about accessibility if we're thinking about accessibility in terms of sort of universal design and ADA accessibility. And that's certainly something that we need to ask in the future. Um, we also were curious to see how the pandemic had impacted all of this. And, and so we asked uh, our institutions that responded to the survey, how did the pandemic change your professional development requirements? And, and I have to tell you, I was um, kind of surprised here uh, that the majority of them said it didn't change. Um, we require the same amount of professional development now that, that we used to require. Uh, and only 11%, almost 11% said that they now require more. So I was a little surprised here. We were curious again to see how the pandemic was sort of impacting all of this. Um, I think that, again, we probably, because we are asking about requirements, I think we would have had a different response had we asked about the availability of professional development. Anecdotally, certainly what we heard during the interviews was that um, COVID and that pivot to either emergency remote instruction 
or online instruction was increasing the availability of professional development. We also asked about the availability in this case, um, the availability of culturally relevant pedagogical uh, practices, um, professional development. And this was, again, we think a really heartening response that over a third of our of the institutions reported that they offered that yes they offered across the institution culturally relevant pedagogical practices professional development and then almost another third said that it was offered at some place on their institution but it differed by college and by department so less than a third said that they knew for certain that they didn't have it so we see this as actually really promising we would love to see that light blue there of yes, our institution offers it to everyone increase. Um, but this certainly is for us a really heartening place to start. And it'll be interesting if we do this uh, report again in subsequent years, how years how this changes. One of the other things that we were really interested in was really beginning to better understand the effective practices that online adjuncts are using um, in their courses. And one of the reasons we were interested in this is, as, as Camille said, I serve as the Chief Strategy Officer for WCET, and then I serve as the Service Design and Strategy Officer for Every Learner Everywhere. Every Learner Everywhere is a Gates Foundation project that is a part of WCET. And Every Learner Everywhere works at the intersection of digital learning, equity, and evidence-based teaching. And so we're really interested in evidence-based teaching practices as they uh, relate to effective digital learning. And there's six evidence-based teaching practices at Every Learner that we really focus on. Uh, we focus on active learning. And there's, there's a number of evidence-based teaching practices out there. But these just happen to be the six that that we're particularly interested in. Those are evident, uh, active learning, scaffolded collaborative learning, relevant learning, formative practice and feedback, uh, limiting cognitive overload, uh, making sure the class understands the learning outcomes and assessment practices, and then metacognition and self-regulation. And so one of the things that we were interested in um, finding out from institutions here is based on what we see as some of the most promising evidence-based teaching practices, what are institutions seeing as the most effective practices by their online adjunct faculty? And there's not anything that's sort of earth shattering here. This is, this is all kind of common sense, but I think it's interesting to see how it breaks down and to see how it maps back to those six evidence-based teaching practices that we're so interested in. So for us, not surprisingly, we see that good instructional design is important. It's almost 66% said a well-organized well course clearly designed. So no surprise there, we know that instructional design matters. You can have the best content in the world. If that course isn't designed well, it is simply not going to be successful. So no surprise there. Um, we found that really effective online adjuncts have figured out how to create connections between themselves and their students. Again, no surprise there. We know in whether it's face-to-face -face or hybrid or online or high flex that community matters and that connections matter. And what makes a difference oftentimes for a student is that connection they have to their instructor and that connection that they have to other students. That that development of a learning community is really critical. And not surprisingly, the most effective online adjuncts have figured out how to do that. We also know that providing timely feedback to student work is really critical, 58.5%. Something to me that's really interesting here, and I'll talk a little bit about later, when I talk about the role of policy in all of this is even though we know that providing that timely feedback is important, even though we know that 
communications as a way of creating community is important. We don't necessarily have policies in place that require that. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment. Uh, and then connections to, between the content and the world, student opportunities for active learning, communicating via email in a timely manner, um, the availability and the approachability of the instructor for the students, providing feedback on course goals and outcomes, and then providing formative feedback to students. All of those surfaced as most effective practices. And if you think about those six evidence-based teaching practices that I, I mentioned just a few moments ago, you see how well these map to those. But conversely, we wanted to understand what were the most challenging practices for these adjuncts. And what we found really interesting to us is that oftentimes the most challenging practices are also identified as the most um, effective practices. Uh, just a second, I'll try to um, take care of your question there, Laura. Just give me a moment here to, to talk a little bit more about the most challenging practices for adjuncts. So we saw that using uh, collaborative learning was the most challenging practice. Again, when you think about um, what we talked about over here, collaborative learning sort of comes out of many of these practices and it's one of those evidence-based teaching practices. Creating connections amongst students was one of the most challenging practices. Facilitating group discussion, providing students an opportunity for active learning, which we know is a really incredibly effective evidence-based teaching practice and then creating an inclusive classroom environment also scored very highly as a challenging practice. And so Laura, your question, did we get any indication of what connection strategies work best for adjuncts in the study? We didn't, um, unfortunately in our follow-up, we didn't ask about that in, in the survey itself and we didn't get that information in our follow-up interviews. We got some information about ways in which institutions tried to connect with their adjunct faculty, but we didn't get any insight into ways that um, adjuncts can uh, connect with their faculty, with their students. I would say that what we know from other research around evidence-based teaching practices, that um, timely and proactive email, uh, email communications with students can be extraordinarily effective um, in creating connection, particularly if it's the faculty member who's initiating it. Um, one of the things that um, the Gates Foundation has been very interested in in recent years, and one of the things that Every Learner has done some research on, as well as has developed some, um, has assisted institutions in doing, is the implementation of adaptive courseware. And from our work with institutions that have implemented adaptive courseware, one of the things that's come out in the research findings is, is when it is successful, um, when the implementation is successful and it makes a difference in students. What we have heard anecdotally from students is that they feel more connected to their instructor. They feel like they're more a part of a learning community because the instructor has been able to use that adaptive courseware to proactively reach out to the student and say, hey, it looks like you're having a problem with X, Y, and Z. Now that's easy to, or to do with adaptive courseware when you've got that sort of dashboard that's feeding you real-time data. But it's possible to do even without adaptive courseware. I can think back, I, I spent my first um, decade of my career as a faculty member uh, and an academic administrator. And, and even when I was an academic administrator, I was teaching. We all know as faculty members, that we have data coming in. We know how students are doing whenever they're, especially if we're giving them formative assessments, we know how they're doing. Being able to use that to proactively reach out to the students, say, you know what? It looks like you're having trouble with this concept. Let's spend some time, let's find some time that we can sit down and talk about that. Or it looks like you're having trouble with this concept. You know what? Here's some alternative resources that might be useful that you can take a look at and then we can have a conversation. So I think there's ways to proactively reach out to, to students that become very effective communication strategies. And they don't have to have all of the bells and whistles. 
They don't have to be adaptive courseware. They don't have to rely on great data dashboards. They really can just rely on us reaching out to our students and checking in and seeing how they're doing. Um, Brandon, your question, did we gather to what extent courses were based off of a master model versus adjuncts having to develop the course themselves? We did. Let me answer that at the end because I'm going to have to look into my notes. I don't have that at the top of my at the top of my head, but we did actually look to see to what extent adjuncts were allowed to make changes to courses. Uh, in addition to what to what extent they were using master course models where they were not allowed to make any changes. Um, so we have these most challenging practices for adjuncts, which we thought was kind of interesting that they overlapped a lot with what the most effective practices were. And that tells us the most effective stuff isn't always the easiest stuff to do. Um, and one of the other things before I talk about those effective strategies, I, I want to talk for a moment about the role of policy in evidence-based teaching, because one of the other things that we asked about was we asked institutions about what type of policies they had in place that impacted online adjuncts. And that included asking institutions about policies around email communication. How long do you wait until, you know, are there requirements about what time period in which you have to respond to a student's email? We asked institutions about office hours, um, online office hours for online courses. And we also asked institutions about um, were there any policies around the amount of time that faculty had to grade an assignment and, and send that assignment back to the student. And there's a few things that we found that are a little disturbing. Um, whenever we think about what these challenging practices are and when we think about what effective evidence-based teaching practices are. So in terms of communication, communication is critical in creating relationship and connection. So in terms of communication, what we found was that almost 33% of the institutions, so almost a third of the institutions that we surveyed said that they had no policy whatsoever. Uh, in regards to faculty responding to student emails. Um, when we asked about grading assignments and whether or not there was a policy about in terms of the amount of time that faculty had to grade assignments and provide that feedback to students, almost half of the institutions said that there was no policy. So almost a third said that there was no policy around communication with students. Almost half said that there was no policy around the amount of time that it takes faculty to provide feedback to students, um, in this case through graded assignments. And then when we asked about office hours and whether or not there were policies around office hours, 61% of institutions said that there was no policy around office hours for online courses. So again, another one of those things that provides a great opportunity for connection between faculty and students, and that we're lacking those policies. And you'll see whenever we talk about, um, and Camille, there's not a slide for this data, but it is outlined in the report, and I've got a link to the report at the end of the uh, presentation. But you see, one of the, one of the things that we think is, is really critical whenever we talk about recommendations is that one of our recommendations is that you can leverage policy in order to be able to improve the, impl the implementation of some of these evidence-based teaching practices. Um, we, also, we also asked institutions about what they thought their most effective strategies were for supporting adjuncts, online adjuncts. And overwhelmingly, um, almost 45% of institutions said that they thought that one of their most effective strategies was one-on-one -on -one training and mentoring. 26% um, professional development. Uh, we thought it was interesting that a little over 20% were moving to asynchronous support and knowledge banks um, as an effective strategy for supporting adjuncts. And I have some, we have some suspicions about why we see that emerging. Uh, a little over 10% said that they thought one of the most effective strategies 
was paying adjunct faculty for professional development, uh, which whenever we drilled down into this and the interviews, the subsequent interviews, one of the things that we heard again and again was, yes, we think it's effective. Unfortunately, being able to pay online adjuncts for that professional development becomes very difficult. Uh, and then one of the things that we thought was um, unfortunate finding here is that over 7% of institutions just were very frank with us and said, we don't think we do it very effectively at all. And over 4% said, we don't know. We don't know if we're effective because we don't assess any of this. So we see some good stuff here. And so what we see is some emerging promising practices. Uh, but we've got a ways to go. And um, Judy, the difference between training and mentoring and professional development is training and mentoring is one-on-one. -on -one. So it's really that one-on-one -on -one mentoring, uh, whereas professional development would be done in groups, either synchronously or asynchronously. Take a look here and see if there's anything else in the chat that I need to hit. And Holly, we don't, we, we didn't drill down to ask who was um, providing that. Although I will say that in um, some of the subsequent interviews that we did where we drilled deeper, we heard um, in one case that it was instructional designers that were providing that one-on-one -on -one mentoring. In one case, we heard that it was um, senior faculty that were providing that one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So we heard that it was a combination of both in some cases, instructional designers, and in some cases, um, senior faculty that were specifically designated as um, mentoring faculty. Um, we also asked, so if those are the promising practices that are emerging around professional development for online adjuncts, what are the barriers? Because clearly there are barriers here. And no major surprises here. Time and money tied as the two biggest barriers. One of the things that we heard when we did our interviews on from many of our interviewees was we would love to have our online faculty, our online um, adjunct faculty participate in our professional development, but they simply don't have the time to do it. They are oftentimes teaching at multiple institutions, trying to cobble together a living wage. We know how difficult that is to do for adjunct faculty, and they don't have time for the professional development, or they're career professionals that are teaching a course um, in their subject area and don't have time for professional development, particularly if that professional development is offered between nine and five office hours on weekdays. And then we heard that funding was an issue. Part of it was funding to pay for online adjuncts. Part of it was just funding to develop the professional development was a major barrier. Availability of adjuncts um, with having multiple commitments, uh, the autonomy of colleges and departments and the lack of resources. In this case, it's a lack of human resources. We simply don't have enough people to be able to offer effective professional development for online adjuncts. We want to, but we just don't have them there to do it. Ben, we have a question from Jean Myers. Sure. Uh, she's asking, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this is before, from Brenda. Uh, she's asking, does the one-to-one -one meet the uh, 2011 CREC guidelines for periodic training or should it be in groups? You know, Brenda, that's a really good question, and I don't know. Um, I'm not as familiar with how those 2011 CREC guidelines have been implemented, especially since um, there has been some discussion of moving beyond the 2011 CREC guidelines. So I don't know. What I would suggest is that you would need to talk with your accreditor um, to make that call, that ultimately that's going to be the accreditor's call, and that you would want to talk with your accreditor um, to see if, uh, what type of training they would find as appropriate here. Mm 
So effective strategies, major barriers, talked a little bit about effective teaching practices, challenging teaching practices, and then sort of what the lay of the landscape looks like in terms of professional development opportunities for faculty, for online adjunct faculty. I want to spend a couple of minutes and then we can have some more question and answer and some conversation with what our recommendations are. So what do we do with all of this information? Well, sorry about that. Um, we've got six major recommendations. One is that we create sustained structured connections with adjunct faculty. And I, and I think we've already seen um, in the chat some conversation about what it means to create one-on-one -on -one or small group mentoring programs that provide some continuous support to online faculty. And it could be regularly scheduled meeting, it could be as needed interactions, it could be feedback from experienced faculty, but all of that can provide really robust opportunities for connection and development. Just like our students need connection, our online adjuncts need connection. They need to feel connected with the rest of the institution um, and that they're not out there just doing it by themselves and alone. Um, we saw offering training that extended beyond traditional business hours, we believe is another really promising practice and a recommendation um, that the more we can provide that training beyond the traditional business hours, the more likelihood that we have of really busy online adjunct faculty being able to access that training. Um, that could be synchronous training. It could be recordings uh, or asynchronous training. But the more that we can do outside of that nine to five, the more likelihood we think there is going to be for online adjuncts to take advantage of that. Now. We recognize that that can be challenging because it requires resources. Um, and that re may require human resources, it may require financial resources to be able to do that. But we do think that this is a, 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 a promising practice. Um, we also think finding ways to incentivize professional development options for online faculty is important. Um, again, though, we recognize that that's, that may be difficult, that institutions see one of their barriers as funding. Um, but if we can find ways to compensate adjunct faculty for their time and to incentivize attendance, maybe in other ways besides financial, then we think that we would see an increase in online adjuncts taking advantage of that professional development. One of the things that was interesting that came out in one of our subsequent interviews was that one of the institutions had done this. They hadn't done this in the past. They hadn't paid online adjuncts for participation in professional development in the past, but they had started doing it recently and they had actually leveraged here funds, those federal COVID relief funds to do that. Some of that COVID relief money is still available. And so that might be one way that your institution could look into being able to incentivize adjuncts to participate in professional development. Uh, we also are recommending, and this isn't an earth shattering recommendation, but we're also recommending that we tailor training content to meet the top um, challenges at your institution. And one of the things that that will require you to do is to gather data to understand what those top challenges are. Remember, I said that in one of our previous slides, about 10% of institutions weren't looking at the effectiveness of their training. They also probably, if they're not looking at the effectiveness of their professional development, they probably aren't gathering data to understand the top challenges at their institution. Um, but we think that being able to begin to gather that data and understand what are the challenges that your online adjunct faculty uh, are facing? It could be really promising in helping you tailor that training so that it really does fit your institutional needs. And again, if we just go on the basis of our study, some of those top challenges that are likely to come up for you is collaborative learning, creating connection between students, facilitating group discussion, active learning strategies, 
creating an inclusive classroom and culturally relevant to teaching. And we have a related question from Chris sure. Harris, and he's asking, did any creative incentives other than pay come up in your research? Yes, and that is what this um, recommendation perfect. is about. So perfect timing. Thank you, Chris. That sets me up nicely. Um, if you can't provide pay, you know, one other way of incentivizing this is to provide recognition for exemplary online adjunct faculty who use effective practices. Um, acknowledge their successes. That could be anything formal from awards or the opportunity to be featured on a program's website. It could be informal means by recognizing them um, with a personal thank you email, a message, or a call. I think some of the other incentives, although we didn't hear institutions using necessarily these incentives, some other incentives might be things like badging and micro credentials. Um, preference in the awarding future um, assignment, teaching assignments. So being able to say, if you want to continue to teach for us, if you want to move up to the top of the list for future adjunct assignments, then be involved in our professional development. So I think that there are some other ways besides pay that you can creatively begin to incentivize. Um, and providing recognition is, is one of those as well. Uh, let me see this. Many adjuncts have to use institutional content. Matt, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think that's one of those things that institutions struggle with whenever they decide whether or not they're going to use master courses. Uh, and it's one of those things that institutions have to take into consideration. On the one hand, using a master course oftentimes streamlines things. It makes sure that you've got um, commonalities in terms of learning outcomes and things like that. Institutions may have um, deals with publishers to be able to provide um, less expensive materials uh, because of bulk purchase. But you're right, that does have... Um, that can have an impact of adjuncts using materials that they're not as familiar with and that could lead them to feel less motivated or feel dis more disconnected. And I think that, that, that you're right that that could happen. And this is one of those things where institutions just have to really carefully think through um, what are the trade-offs and what are the advantages for each one of those um, responses. Um, and then the final recommendation that we had was that institutions think about creating well-designed policies that guide instructors in determining when and how to respond to students. Um, these are the sorts of policies that can really help make sure that there's consistent, effective communication. These are also sometimes difficult policies to implement because at some institutions, they may begin to infringe on academic freedom. And we recognize that, but we think that where institutions can have those policies, that it's worth certainly having a conversation about those policies. So uh, I am happy to, uh, if there are any lingering questions that you have that we don't get to today, I'm happy to have you email me and I'll do my best to answer those questions. I've also included a link here as well as uh, to the um, report that we recently published, Online Adjunct Faculty, a survey of institutional policies and practices. There will be a um, faculty playbook that OLC will be publishing um, later this um, spring that we will also link to on the Every Learner Everywhere website. Uh, I will be um, sending out a PDF of this to uh, Alexandra Pickett so that y'all will be able to access it as well so that you've got this link and you've got the materials. Um, and then let's see, Danette has a question here. I'm interested in knowing people's definition of academic freedom. Does it cover only content and views or does it extend to practices use? I think that's a really good question, Danette. Um, it wasn't something that we looked at in detail. I will say that we had in our follow-up interviews that we had more than one individual that said um, their ability to require professional development was oftentimes um, pushed back on 
from faculty as an impingement on academic freedom. I love what Jesse has said here in many of my faculty's opinions, it extends to everything. I have to say full disclosure, when I was a faculty member, I probably defined it as extending to everything as well. Um, it's one of those times though, where I think that if we can have a conversation with faculty, I mean, ultimately our faculty want their students to be successful. That's something that every faculty member has in common. We want our students to succeed. I think if we can begin to have conversations with faculty about why we think these policies are important and how these policies can likely impact student success, that we may get more buy-in from faculty about, okay, it makes sense to have this sort of policy. So I'm going to stop right now and see if there are any other questions. Uh, and then I've got a couple of questions for y'all, if there aren't. Van, I was just wondering if you could spend a moment talking about the Every Learner, Every Learner Everywhere organization and what their mission is and how it connects to WCET? Sure. So Every Learner Everywhere is a Gates-funded project that's housed within WCET. WCET is the fiduciary for it. Uh, and, you know, WCET for us is all about community equity policy and practice. Um, we feel like that um, effective teaching practices are critical for student success. We believe that policy, whether it is sound institutional level policy or sound federal and state level policy, is critical for student success. And that we can begin to do that through creating a community of practitioners that are concerned at their center about equity in student learning. Every Learner Everywhere fits very well with WCET because Every Learner Everywhere really operates at the intersection of digital learning, equity, and evidence-based teaching practices. We conduct research around what are the effective digital learning practice, uh, teaching practices. Um, we do that in partnership. Um, we're a network actually of 12 partners. We do a lot of work on our research side with um, Digital Promise, which does fantastic uh, quantitative and qualitative research. We also have done a number of case studies based on working with institutions in collaboration with two of our other partners, uh, APLU, American Public Land Grants uh, Universities, and Achieving the Dream uh, on the community college side. <clears throat> And then one of our other key partners, we've, we've got a couple of other key partners that we have developed some deep um, services and technical assistance with. Um, Titan Partners, which does a lot of change management work uh, on an institutional level. And then also in the past, we've done a great deal of work with OLC and they're another one of our value partners. Um, some of our other partners include South by Southwest EDU, um, uh, American Association of Chief Academic Officers, uh, Intentional Futures, um, ISTE are some of our other partners. So Every Learner Everywhere is, sits within WCET, but it is really very well aligned with WCET's values. Thank you so much, Van. Appreciate that. So I've got a question for y'all since there don't seem to be any questions for me. And I know this is something that there's been a great deal of conversation on in the chat, but I would really love it if somebody could come off mic and talk about what they see as their most effective um, practices around professional development for online adjuncts at their institution. Please go ahead, Maureen. Thank you. Hi there. Um, so one of the things that we tried to do is be more flexible with our scheduling for training. So last year we started doing um, 7 p.m. evening sessions for adjuncts at <clears throat> um, 6 p.m. Then we tried, you know, late Fridays. But these evening sessions was the first time that everyone that registered showed up for the session. Oh wow! And stuck with it and wow. we had a few you know 
um, you know, parent, all working parents, working people. And the overall comment was, I can finally come to this because it's finally being offered when I can attend. And it was by Zoom. So two things that, that worked very effectively. The precursor to that is we had played around with it a little bit doing um, just various scheduling. We have adjuncts who might be, you know, an hour away or something. And I said, oh, no problem. I'll meet you on Saturday on Zoom. We'll do it. Um, and we had a lot of that was great. So then we went another step. So that was probably one of the most effective things that we've done. That's fantastic. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, what about you, Jesse? I see your hand up. Yeah, so um, I'll mention two things. First, um, to, to the survey's point, one-to-one -one, uh, training and support. Mm -hmm. um, we typically assign an instructional designer as a, as a first point of contact to any adjunct teaching a course for the first time. Um, and we found that be really, it's been really helpful for them to know that they have someone they can reach out to for any kind of technical or pedagogical question. The other thing that I don't think I saw mentioned, but maybe is kind of aligned with that, is involving faculty as presenters in training. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, they really, really value hearing from um, their colleagues on what's worked yeah. for them. And it also helps validate the work that we do. They come and they say, I worked with Jesse's team and they were amazing and it was so helpful. And that gives us a little bit of cred credential with, uh, with a lot of adjuncts. That's fantastic. Uh, I think I saw Adele and then uh, Carla. Hello. Um, one of the most effective ways I have found in training faculty is to do one-on-one. -on -one. It's always mm -hmm. worked. Um, and I found during the pandemic that offering virtual office hours was even more effective because they were able to see what I was doing and I could see what they were doing. And it was just a much more effective way for them to get that hands-on uh, experience. So I, I've, I stick to that. Large groups tend to be too overwhelming and they miss mm -hmm. certain things in translation. So I like to do one-on-one -on -one and virtual. Well, and, and why wouldn't virtual office hours be effective? I mean, we know that virtual office hours are effective for our students. Why wouldn't they be effective for our instructors as well? You um, know, it, it was not something that was ever done in my institution, and it was it took the pandemic to push it into that um, arena. So, um, yeah, I agree with you. It was totally the best way, in my opinion. Thank you. What about you, Carla? Hi. Let me. Okay. <laughs> You get the, the full class. I teach in like the world's most awesome classroom. I'm a cybersecurity <laughs> professor and we have this. Okay, let me back up a little bit. We have this magnificent lab thing. Look at all of those screens that I have. So we're able to completely zoom students in if they're, you know, quarant if they're they're sick. I, I tell people no matter what you're sick with, if you're contagious, please don't come to class. So they can just zoom in. And then this also allows if we have faculty members who are either you know at a conference or sick or whatever that they can zoom in someone just comes in and you know make sure that the room is ready for the students and gets the zoom thing all set up so um, the the pandemic has has been awesome because uh well from that perspective because it's really put us into a perspective of this is how we can we can do online things we can also bring in guest speakers really easily but the the main reason that i wanted to say something was that i um mentor, I guess you could say manage, I do performance management for a group of cybersecurity mm -hmm. adjunct faculty, the program director, that's what we call our department chairs, and I split them up. And so I created a Microsoft Teams area and I dubbed them Team Scorpion because that just kind of sounds fun. And, and so we do professional development inside Team Scorpion. There's different channels for them, like, you know, taming Blackboard, you know, having a problem with a student, here's how that works. And then this fall, I'm going to do something I'm calling ScorpyCon which will be you know, an online conference that's specifically for them to share like, this is cool professional development that they've done because a lot of, a lot of cybersecurity revolves around certification. So we have to have mm -hmm. continuing education. And then also just, this is how I teach this class. So you wanna learn more tips about teaching access control, come to this session. You wanna learn more about social engineering, come to this session. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, that does. That makes perfect sense. And and again, it's, I'm I'm really struck by how much of this um, mirrors what um, we know works with students as well. I think we've got time for one more, and I think Krista, you get to be our last one. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that we've definitely used policy as a means to get all of our adjunct instructors up to the same um, baseline proficiency. So it's actually a condition of employment in their offer letter for appointment or reappointment that they complete um, either our internal online teaching certificate or a comparable external resource. Um, it's a self-paced, asynchronous, pretty brief um, two or five week module. So it's very much um, something they can do on their own time, on their own schedule. And although, you know, you get some gripes here or there about it, in the end, most of them have found it really valuable that they've actually said, thank you for making me do that. I think I can teach my course so much better than I, than I knew mm -hmm. I could. That's fantastic. Ben, I'm wondering if we could just sneak in one last question from the chat. Sure, uh, and sure. This is from uh, Greg Gear. He's asking, are there examples of effective adjunct instructor policies that might be helpful in writing such policies? So do we have any resources that we can? Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm not aware of a, a centralized set of examples. I think though, what you're starting to hear just today is that you can look at some of your sister institutions for some of those examples. And I, I think that's one of the things to me that's really wonderful about what SUNY Online does um, with this conference in developing this community is being able to work with each other to sort of talk about, hey, this is what we're doing at our institution and it's working like Krista just talked about, this is what we're doing with our institution around policy. Um, so I would I would urge you to look look to each other um, because you can learn more from each other. Appreciate it. Thank you. Alexandra, do you want to have a closing comment? Yes, I just want to say thank you so much to Van for your very um, thoughtful and um, informative, um, you know, insightful uh, report and commentary and facilitating this conversation around supporting on, um, online adjunct faculty and to Camille Carlson for moderating and to everyone who attended. Um, thank you so much for your, your time and your attention and, and um, for being, you know, um, attentive to this very important topic. We really appreciate you, Van, coming and, and presenting all of the, um, and engaging us in this conversation, which I think is um, particularly timely and relevant and, and of interest to, um, to broad um, you know, audiences or stakeholders within our community. So I appreciate you very much for that. And all the work that you do at WCET. <laughs> Love our friends at yeah. WCET. Um, so I so yeah so thank you and and please like uh, show your um, applause in the in the chat or 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 with the little reaction buttons if you would. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview. Um, the next session will be starting up at one o'clock on this same bat channel here. The same link works for everything. Um, so please come back for our open networking session. Um, the the target. Um, audiences, online faculty, but really anyone who's interested in anything, um, you know, around online teaching and learning is welcome. So if you're a faculty, if you're an instructional designer or a director or a, support, a student support person, come back and talk with us and we can have more conversations around any of the sessions we've seen now during the summit or any of the upcoming ones, or if you have specific questions, um, we can, it's very informal, it's not recorded, there's no agenda, it's just a networking session. So I hope you will come back and, and build, um, help build more of those connections and community that Van was so nice enough to call out and recognize. Um, and then later uh, this afternoon at three o'clock, we have um, our friends Cassandra Thompson and Rafael Perez from Madison uh, College coming to talk with us about strategies for culturally responsive online teaching in STEM, which is a fabulous presentation. I hope you will come back for 
that. Um, and if not, the recordings are will be available um, and all of the materials, as Van mentioned, will be posted as soon as I get them um, on, the, on the page in the, here, let me go grab it for you. Uh, the recordings, including the materials and the chat and uh, everything that goes with each presentation will be posted um, here at that link that I just um, put in the chat. And so far I've posted the slides from um, many of the presentations that have happened so far. And we're just in the process of rendering the recordings and getting those up into YouTube and then linked over to this page. So, so stay tuned for that. And, um, and you can stay here in this room um, and wait, or you can leave and come back, um, what, whatever you like, and we will see everyone back here. What time did I say? Is it one o'clock? <laughs> what did I say? No, I can't find 